This is a lecture over chapter 29, section 3. We're going to be looking at diatomic molecules. The summary here uh, is going to focus on ionic bonds, which are bonds between two ionized atoms. One atom donates at least one electron to fill a vacancy in the shell of the other. In a covalent bond, the electron cloud tends to concentrate between the atoms. Uh, the positive nucleus of each atom is attracted to the somewhat centralized electron cloud. And there are also weaker bonds, such as the van der Waals and hydrogen bonds. All right, so studying electron configurations in atoms provides a valuable insight to the nature of chemical bonds. The interactions that hold atoms together to form stable structures such as molecules and solids. There are several types of chemical bonds including ionic, covalent, van der Waals, and hydrogen bonds. So the ionic bond is also called the electrovalent or heteropolar bond. It is an, inter in is an interaction between two ionized atoms. The most familiar example is sodium chloride or table salt in which the sodium atom gives its one 3s electron to the chlorine atom, filling the vacancy in the 3p subshell of chlorine. So if we take a look at the energy balance of the transaction, removing the 3s electron from the sodium atom requires 5.1 eV of energy, and that's called the ionization energy or ionization potential, sodium. Chlorine has an electron affinity of 3.6 eV. That is a natural uh, the neutral chlorine atom can attract an extra electron into the vacancy in its 2p subshell where the electron is attracted to the nucleus with an attractive potential energy of magnitude 3.6 thus creating the separated uh, na ion and the chlorine ion requires a net expenditure of the difference between the two or 1.5 eV uh, when the two mutually attracting ions come together, the magnitude of their negative potential energy is determined by the closeness to which they can approx uh, approach each other. This in turn is limited by the exclusion principle, which forbids extensive overlap of the electron clouds of the two ions. So the minimum potential energy for NaCl turns out to be minus 5.7 eV at a separation of 0.24 nanometers. At distances less than this, the interaction becomes repulsive. The net energy given up by the system in creating the ions and letting them come together to the equilibrium separation of 0 0.24 is minus 5.7 plus 1.5 or minus 4.2 eV. And this is the binding energy of the molecule. In other words, 4.2 eV of energy is needed to dissociate the molecule into separate neutral atoms. Ionic bonds are interactions between charge distributions that are nearly symmetric. Their electrical interaction is similar to that of the two point charges, so they're not highly directional. They can involve more than one electron per atom. The alkaline earth metals from ionic compounds in which an atom loses two electrons, such as a magnesium, uh, and chlorine, and I forget exactly what the name of that ionic compound is. Um, loss of two of more than two electrons is relatively rare. Instead, a different kind of bond comes into operation. So the covalent or the homopolar bond is characterized by a more near symmetric participation of the two atoms. In contrast to the asymmetry of the electron transfer process of the, bond, of the ionic bond, the simplest example of the covalent bond is the bond in, in the hydrogen molecule, a structure containing two pro protons and two electrons. And so this bond is shown schematically here. As the separate atoms come together, the electron wave functions are distorted uh, from the configurations of isolated atoms and become more concentrated in the regions of the two protons. The net attraction of the electrons for each proton more than balances the repulsion, repulsion of the protons and the, that of the two electrons. The energy of the covalent bond is minus 4.48 eV. So if there's a large separation, there's no interaction, 
The covalent bond, the charge clouds for the two electrons with the opposite spin S are concentrated in the region in between. The exclusion principle permits two electrons to occupy the same region of space only when they have opposite spins. When the spins are parallel, the state that would be most favorable in terms of energy considerations, both electrons and the regions between the atoms, is forbidden by the exclusion principle. So thus, opposite spins are an essential requirement for an electron pair bond, and no more than two electrons can participate in that. However, an atom with several electrons in its outermost shell can form several electron pair bonds. The bonding of carbon and hydrogen atoms, which is, of course, organic chemistry, uh, is an example. The methane molecule, the carbon atom, is at the center of a rectangular, of a regular tetrahedron with a hydrogen atom at each corner. The carbon atom has four electrons in its shell, and one of these electrons forms a covalent bond with each of the four hydrogen atoms, as shown here. Similar patterns occur in more complex uh, organic compounds. So ionic and covalent bonds represent two extremes in the nature of molecular bonds, but there's no real sharp division between the two types. Often there is a particle transfer of one or more electrons uh, from one to the other. As a result, many molecules with dissimilar atoms have electric dipole moments, a preponderance of positive charge at one end and uh, negative at the other. Some molecules are called polar molecules. Water molecules have an exceptionally large electric dipole moment that are responsible for exceptionally large dielectric constant of liquid water. Ionic and covalent bonds with typical bond energies of 1 to 5 eV are considered strong bonds. There are also two types of much weaker bonds with typical, typical energies of 0 0.5 eV or less. And one of those is the van der Waals bond, uh, and that is an interaction between the electric dipole moments of two atoms or molecules. The bonding of water molecules in the liquid and solid states result partly from dipole-dipole interactions. The interaction potential energy drops off very quickly with distance r, usually in a proportion of one over r to the sixth. That's pretty sharp. So even when an atom or molecule has no permanent dipole moment, uh, fluctuating charge distributions can lead to fluctuating dipole moments that in turn can induce dipole moments in neighboring structures. So the resulting dipole-dipole interaction can be attractive and lead uh, to weak bonding of atoms or molecules. The low temperature liquefaction, solidification of the inert gas of such molecules as hydrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen are due to induced dipole van der Waals interactions. Not much thermal agitation energy is needed to break these weak bonds, so such substances usually exist in the liquid and solid states only at very low temperatures. Another type of weak bond, the hydrogen bond, is analogous to the covalent bond in which the electron pairs bind two positively charged structures. In the hydrogen bond, a proton gets in between two atoms, polarizing them and attracting them by means of the induced dipoles. This bond is unique to hydrogen-containing compounds because only hydrogen has a single ionized state with no remaining electron cloud. The hydrogen ion is a bare proton, much smaller than any single ionized atom. The energy required to break the hydrogen bond is so small, usually about 0 0.5 eV, and hydrogen bonding is an essential role in many molecules. It provides the cross-linking of polymer chains, such as polyethylene, and the cross-linking between two strands of the double helix DNA molecule. All of these types of bonds play a role in the solids, in the structure of solids, as well as molecules. Indeed, a solid in many respects is a giant molecule. So as a type of bonding, the metallic bond comes into play in the structures of metallic solids, and we'll get to that before too long. Um, all molecules have quantized energy levels associated with the internal motion of their electrons. In addition, an entire molecule can rotate. The simplest example, a diatomic, diatomic molecule can be thought of as a rigid dumbbell that can rotate around the axis through its center of mass. The angular momentum associated with this is quantized just as the angular momentum of an electron in an atom is quantized. So the kinetic energy associated with the rotational motion is also quantized. 
the molecule has a series of rotational energy levels and because a molecule is always much more massive than the individual electron, these levels are much more closely spaced than are the usual atomic energy levels. Its corresponding photon energies associated with transitions among these levels are in the far infrared region of the spectrum. And you've also got vibrational energies going on uh, as well. A molecule is never completely rigid. A bond can stretch and flex. Hence, a more realistic method of a diatomic molecule consists of two masses connected by a spring rather than a rigid rod, which is what this is trying to exemplify. And transitions among these levels uh, here lead to complex infrared spectra with bands of spectral lines. All molecules can have excited states of their electrons in addition to the rotating and vibrating states we have discussed. In general, these lie at much higher energies than the rotational and vibrational states. And you got a few problems there that you can work through. 